So, welcome everyone. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this event. I always find them very enlightening. It's a great opportunity to share things and learn things. Um, although this event is slightly different, uh, but I'm thinking back a little bit to when we hosted the Milestones Conference in Cape Town, and some of you were present. Um, and I'm going to be presenting some of the work that's happened in this interceding period, not exhaustively, but some of the main points and specifically related to the violence prevention policy in the province, sorry, policy framework, um, and some of the successes and challenges. Now, to begin, I feel very cluttered here. That's better. Okay. I'll stand next to the window as well. Um, it was very useful having the template that was provided by the organizers. I'm going to try to speak to it a bit before I digress. Um, to start the contribution to homicide reduction and, okay, so the obvious thing for me is if we're planning on reducing homicide by 50% in the next 30 years, we need to be focusing on those countries with very large burdens of violence and very high homicide rates. Um, the map is a little bit out of date. I don't think the picture has changed substantially, but the latest Global Burden of Disease study, which defines 21 different health regions, squarely puts a few countries at the top of the pile in terms of their homicide rates, or regions at least. I think the country analysis is still coming out. Um, and sub -Saharan, southern sub-Saharan Africa is the top of that list. Um, and Central and Tropical Latin America also feature very prominently. So I think it's rather obvious uh, if we're going to achieve that reduction where we need to be focusing our intervention efforts. Uh, in the Western Cape, it's uh, important to see how we compare, both globally and nationally. The Western Cape is one of South Africa's nine provinces. Uh, you can see that South African homicide rate is considerably higher than the global average, and the Western Cape is higher still. Um, it's Five point, uh, you know, between six and six and a half times the global average, which is really considerable. Um, I don't think I bring it out very clearly in this presentation, but a large amount, a lot of those deaths are, are amongst males. And so this morning session, the, the issue of what to do about male homicide and, and, where, and male violence and uh, male violence against women in particular is very important, but it's also male on male violence, which accounts for a large amount of the burden in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, oops, okay, wrong button. Okay, the good news is that things are or were improving at least. So from 2000 to 2009, we saw homicide rates reduce by approximately 40% in just nine years. So these types of um, targets are achievable. Uh, I've put were in brackets because I think there's evidence to show that things are now reverting back to, um, well, things are changing slightly, and I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit in the next few slides. Um, but I'm not sure when this 30% reduction starts. Is the next 30 years, does it start in 2014? Because unfortunately, we're a little bit ahead of, ahead of the curve. So we would like to prove that reduction. But if we could take it back uh, about a decade, it would be very helpful. Right. Risk factors. I, 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 we've seen the ecological model presented this morning um, in, in several presentations, and many of you are going to be familiar with it. And I don't want to elaborate here in any great length about all the risk factors in South Africa. I just wanted to say that we really represent the perfect storm in terms of risk factors. Um, the ones that you list, we have, we have them in abundance. So the next few slides, I will go through this very superficially, but there are other... other um, other uh, articles and, and um, analyses that, that depict these much more comprehensively. Those are two of them, but there are many more. Uh, but I don't know if you can see, this is supposed to say, and very faintly, that's supposed <coughs> to be the, the biological and behavioral risks. Uh, one of the, the most striking ones in, in um, urban South Africa is the demographic um, prevalence of, or the high percentage of young males uh, that live in very low income um, communities and many of them are unemployed, have very poor prospects and, and so that demographic um, aspect is very important. Mental health is a prevailing problem. Uh, people have been exposed to violence for a very long time in South Africa as a, a long-term trajectory in, in terms of what happens next. Alcohol and other drug abuse are also particular problems. There are obviously a range of other factors that I'm not even going to list here. This is really just to give a bit of a highlights package to those that are unfamiliar with the context. Um, in the family and community, 
uh, large families, mothers having children at a young age, single parent households, low socioeconomic status in those households, abusive parenting behaviors. These are all uh, risk factors of, that are particularly prevalent. You have to press it twice. Okay. Socioculturally, um, most of you would be aware of the recent history in South Africa that has been very violent. Apartheid itself, the liberation struggle, had a lot of violence in it. Um, there's racism, there's xenophobia more recently directed at people from outside South Africa. Violence is frequently used to resolve conflicts. Uh, most recently, there have been service delivery protests across the country and a new public order policing bill that is going to be used to clamp down on those service delivery protests. Uh, there's, there was a, the, the massacre in, in Marikana in the northwest province, which was very similar to the apartheid state with a police response where, people were, where, where uh, tens of people were shot and killed. And mob justice in the areas that we're working <coughs> in are very, is, is very common. And of course, there's gun culture, which is, has been in the headlines recently, recently with the Oscar Pistorius case. But there are, there are many more gun deaths um, happening on a daily basis. And then, of course, socio, socio-structurally, inequality, we have the world's highest Gini coefficient. We've got very high rates of unemployment, and there's rapid urbanization, both internally from rural parts of South Africa and people coming from outside into urban areas. Um, which obviously also fuels conflict and violence. It's been mentioned already in this conference that most studies that describe the evidence are from high-income contexts. Uh, but we're quite pleased to, and I think the evidence base shows that the two um, interventions to reduce violence that have been demonstrated as being effective in South Africa, uh, Stepping Stones, which I know Rachel Jukes was very involved in, a communication program, and in an image, a microfinance and gender equity program are two of the interventions that are included in the global evidence base, and then numerous other pilots and interventions that are being tested. The, okay, we've lost a bit at the bottom. The Burden of Disease Project, which is basically the forerunner to the integrated um, violence prevention policy framework, took a slightly different approach. Um, and because it was looking at the burden of disease, not just violence and injuries, but mental health, major infectious diseases, the idea was to look upstream. Um, and what this project found uh, across all disease types, really, is that the evidence resided primarily downstream at the behavioral and um, biological levels, which forced a, a programmatic um, intervention um, effort rather than an upstream focus. Um, but interventions at the societal and structural levels potentially offered far larger gains in terms of reducing all types of diseases and also the potential to mitigate for different disease types. So if you have an intervention that addresses gender norms, it might um, influence both <coughs> HIV and violence at the, uh, simultaneously. If you have a policy that, um, that impacts on education or, or, uh, a chi- or early childhood development, it, it impacts on a range of different outcomes. And this is consistent with the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. So this project tried to balance these two aspects to violence prevention. Firstly, focusing on quick wins. Again, at a upstream level, the two um, most prominent ones were, 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 were focus on firearms and gun control, and then on alcohol and other drug abuse as well, but particularly alcohol in the South African context. While at the same time trying to put in place strategies that had long-term impacts, early childhood development, youth development strategies, and then changing and challenging some of the cultural norms. Just very briefly as an aside, we were able to show evidence of of the impact of gun control um, between 2000 and 2005 with the implementation of the Firearms Control Act where we saw a significant decrease in homicide overall and firearm homicide in particular of 13.6% per annum compared to a 2.4% decrease in non-firearm homicide uh, which was indicative of the the impact of of a policy policy legislation in terms of how it would reduce homicide. You'll recall that my graph said we had experienced a decrease. I think there's evidence that more recently the gun control laws have not been well implemented. There have been a number of leaks and and illegal licensing of firearms. And also only some of the guns were actually um, subject to the Firearms Control Act. There were a lot of guns that were were 
legalized previously that are still in the pool. So it was diminished. It's, the, the extent of um, its impact has been diminished by, by, uh, by other acts that have been in place beforehand. And what we're seeing now is actually an increase again in gun homicide. And so this, these are laws that need to be strengthened. Okay, so the need for a policy framework. I think it's evident from the previous slides that prevention is very complicated and we've heard a lot in, in a lot more detail this morning why it's complicated and I think I'm repeating some of what's been said before. The risks span the ecological spectrum. So if we're going to do anything, it needs to be sustained, it needs to be multidimensional and it needs to happen over a long period of time. Um, and then of course the challenges of replication and scale. What I haven't put in there, which is of course very important, is that policymakers are rather fickle and like to do things that have an appearance of, of being effective very quickly, and that long-term thinking is not necessarily something that matters to them when you've got a five-year electoral cycle. Um, you only have to do something that, that has the appearance of being effective in five years, so a lot of these long-term strategies uh, fall off the map. Now, one of the very important the, the paper t for this conference sets out uh, a, a lot more of the history, but one of the very important events was our hosting the milestones of the Global Campaign for Violence Prevention um, in Cape Town in 2011, and it was hosted by the Western Cape Government with the National Health Department, so we already had two tiers of government and obviously with support from the WHO. Um, and uh, part of it was Peter's inquiry as well, or, or Alison specifically, asking policymakers um, what type of uh, policy do you have underpinning this uh, violence prevention strategy that you're pursuing? And it was clear that there wasn't one. It was, it was um, running on goodwill, the, um, which of course is a strategic weakness if you're trying to do something over the course of you know, more than five years. Um, so there was a need to have some type of coherence and clarity um, to what the province was attempting that was also consistent with global best practice and also able to balance those long and short term um, priorities. So uh, over the next two years we, we, we developed a policy framework, policy framework rather than policy is important and I'll explain why, um, which was adopted by the provincial cabinet August, in August last year. Um, it blends the public health and whole of society approaches. I'm assuming that, that you're familiar with some of those. If not, we can pick that up in discussion. Uh, very important was the inclusion of evidence-led interventions, and se several are listed within the, prov within the policy. Safe, stable, and nurturing relationships between children, parents, and caregivers, life skills in children and adolescents, gender equality, and alcohol policy was seen as a very important strategy as well, and one that, that um, we were quite um, successful in changing uh, the Western Cape Liquor Act to restrict access to alcohol, as, as an example, in parallel to this policy framework. Can you um, ask a question? Yes, sure. Is guns then dropped out of that? Control. Well, we th <coughs> no, it hasn't dropped out, but the Firearms Act Control Act was in place. Okay. So uh, it is mentioned in the policy, but it wasn't an, an area where uh, mm. the province itself had to do anything over and above what, what should really be um, underway already. I think we need to revisit it, though. Um, okay. Um, then also the use of reliable surveillance data focusing on high-risk areas was also seen as an important um, component and trying to institutionalize monitoring and evaluation of everything that the, the, the provincial government was attempting. Okay, so it's only been a year, but I think it's important for us to ask the question how we, we're doing. That's Batman, Alex, after, after the event. After one year after we've introduced the policy, has, what, what, is, um, what is the situation now? Um, so I've picked out four I think four of, of the main um, aspects to the policy. The first, engaging the whole of society. We've been moderately effective with this. I think the policy itself is, is consistent with other policy developments. So the, the provincial government has a what they call a provincial transversal management system, which tries to bring things together across departmental silos. So it's not just a health problem, but they would bring in role players from social development and education to address a, a problem collectively. Um, there are eight strategic objectives, one, one of which is increasing wellness and another one is increasing safety. Um, 
there's a provincial crime prevention strategy that is being developed to coordinate three spheres of government around policing and crime prevention. Uh, but it is also apparent that these silos are prevailing despite these um, macro structures that are in place. Um, for example, when we have working groups within the increasing wellness um, provincial strategic objective, that's housed within health, obviously, and we try and co-opt people from these different departments. But that's seen as health's transversal strategy. Increasing safety will co-opt similar people from different departments, and there will be a competing set of priority, and that's community safety's transversal strategy. So it's, uh, it's token intersectorality in a sense, and it's very difficult when their budgets attached to actually make these things enforceable. So that's one of the problems. Um, there's a focus on crime rather than violence as the overarching social ill, and I think that's just a habit. Um, the police, which are a national competency, have stalled the provincial crime prevention strategy too, which speaks to um, a, a bit of a, a, a turf battle between national and provincial competen competencies, and I think that we're seeing that play out. Uh, the National Development Plan also, as, an over, as a national strategy, focus on, on criminal justice and policing. It's worth noting it also mentions evidence-based practices, but it, when it comes to the nuts and bolts, doesn't actually include any of them. It's, it's, a, it's a handy buzzword. Um, and then there's also a tension between security services, private se the private sector policing, um, and police in the public sector, which leads to uh, security inequality in the sense that um, people that are poor get offered uh, um, poor service and they're unable to pay for complementary policing that's necessary. So the whole of society is a good concept. We're finding some currency, but the implementation is not quite there. Things are slightly worse with evidence-based practice. Um, so we're finding that uh, interventions in epidemiology are inconsistently interpreted and often misunderstood. Um, and this is happening globally as well. I think uh, it wasn't mentioned specifically today, but you know the, the World Health Assembly's latest resolution um, specifically excludes young men as a vulnerable group. I mean, it's for everyone else except men. Um, and nationally, you see this in the National De Development Plan. Um, okay, I've mentioned the, the crime prevent the, the the two intersectoral strategies ignore evidence-based solutions, and it's become even more apparent in the Western Cape. And there are two two recent examples in the last year: the Western Cape Liquor Act, which was set to reduce access to alcohol, has now been undermined by the city of Cape Town under pressure from the liquor industry, and they've extended access to alcohol. It's now more available legally than ever before. So we have a program to evaluate interventions around alcohol, and what we're seeing is a, something of an anti-intervention. So we're expecting alcohol-related violence to increase, despite the fact that we have a policy framework where it's specifically <coughs> mentioned. Um, another a more minor example is we saw boxing promoted as a key diversion strategy for youths at risk. And this was despite concerns from the health department about the link between boxing, um, head injuries, and possible brain injuries, and then the increase in long-term risk of aggression. Um, so evidence-based solutions feature in, in the policy frameworks, but when it actually comes to implementation, there are other understandings of what constitutes evidence. I've got a nice anecdote to share, but in the interests of time, I might save that for discussion. Um, but there is a problem around the use of the word evidence, which I, is, I, I, um, I think we need to question. People have different understandings of what constitutes evidence. All right, surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation, we've been much more successful. Um, the provincial injury mortality surveillance system is now fully institutionalized <coughs> within the province. So we, are, we have full cover coverage of injury deaths, um, and that system is improving all the time. So we can look at long-term trends, and we can look at the impact of policies such as gun control. Uh, the provincial, OK, this, there are surveillance sites that have been established in selected high-risk high communities to evaluate two upstream interventions, alcohol and urban upgrading, and those make use of spatial data, um, supported by international grants, and also the Department of Health, the Department of the Premier, and the City of Cape Town. So it's important, again, two tiers of mm. government. Um, it includes repeat cross-sectional injury studies at health facilities, which are also spatially located. So we have 
reasonable outcome data. We have annual surveys taking place in those communities looking at, at violence and experience of, of security and, and incidents, also alcohol, mental health, and a range of other factors and some quite frightening um, findings in terms of, of people's exposure to violence and underlying mental health issues in, in those communities and access to alcohol, of course. And part of that is to, part of the project is to develop indicators to try and describe five key thematic areas, which we, that's the first pass. These aren't the, uh, this isn't the entirety of, of factors that are going to impact on violence and safety, but we think they're important ones for which to make a start. Okay. The focus on high-risk areas, that's also been very uh, um, positive. Um, one of the urban upgrading intervention we're evaluating is called violence prevention through urban upgrading. Some of you might have seen it at, at other conferences. It's the city of Cape Town's flagship project and includes not only um, improved urban design, but also a whole social component as well and, and a governance aspect to make sure that programs are sustainable. Uh, that has been expanded to five other municipalities over the next four years with rather a huge sum of money um, by local standards from the German Development Bank and the provincial government's regional socio-economic program. Uh, this is leading to a proposal for an, a UN Habitat affiliated centre of excellence which will act as a training resource for other sites in the region for replication um, and a monitoring and evaluation hub. And then the monitoring and evaluation itself um, is attracting attention from the Western Cape government to establish something much more um, sustainable beyond the, the pilot stage of this project over the next five years to fund a, something of a surveillance site or an observatory in the areas where we have started this data collection. So to conclude, and I think I'm just about out of time, so the main success, I would say, of, of what we've, we've done so far has been the broad support for the interventions in the high-risk communities, um, the support for the idea of a surveillance site for ongoing monitoring and evaluation. The main failure, of course, is this questionable adherence to evidence-based approaches to violence prevention. Um, and I don't think it's unique to South Africa. I think as soon as you're speaking to policymakers and politicians, there is a, the, the language is rather different. There is a new opportunity. I, I'm not quite sure what to make of it yet, but the Western Cape government, through their intersectoral strategy, has introduced a new combined strategic objective to look at increasing wellness and safety and tackling social ills all at the same time. So because we're putting everything in the same pot, it might, m might evolve into something that's not strictly in a silo but is truly intersectoral. So I have some hope for that, but I, I'm not quite sure where it's going to end up. Concluding comments and recommendations, I think clearly the policy framework needs teeth. And what, what's become apparent is that a policy framework guides a set of policies but it is not a policy in itself. It's not actionable, it's not implementable, um, and people aren't held to account in terms of their adherence to a policy framework. And that, so it needs to start informing actionable policies. Um, it's clear that there needs to be some type of formative research to, to test decision makers' understanding of, of evidence. Um, how is it used and which other factors guide their responses? Because it's clearly not just what we consider to be evidence. Uh, the current interventions need to be critically appraised. And there needs to be a steering committee to provide oversight, stewardship and evaluation of those provincially funded interventions. I think it needs to include decision makers, but also researchers that are familiar with and understand evidence-based research. Um, and then finally, I think if we are to push this forward, we need to be able to demonstrate the utility of the data that we're collecting. The gun study was one example, but we need to actually be able to demonstrate now at a micro area what, some of the imp what, what the impacts are of some of the strategies that, that are being implemented. And I think that is it. Yep. All right, and there's a long list of acknowledgements. I think it's, also, it's just important to note that this is a single author paper. There's, there's some names that appear here that have been very, um, very important in the, the development of the policy and the research, but they can't be named because they're linked with the provincial <laughs> government. So it's okay for me to stand here uh, with an <coughs> academic affiliation and say these things, but this isn't the official line. Um, but they have seen it. I won't say who approved of it, but it's, uh, I, th I think the sentiment that I've expressed is, is um, 
I think most of those people, maybe not all, would agree with it, <laughs> but they can't sign on, and I think it's indicative of uh, some of the tension we're experiencing. Thanks. Let's, um, let's